Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Inca Josh, and there's Inca Chuck and Inca Jerry's over there. So <laughs> this is an Inca cast. Stuff you should Inca. Short stuff you should Inca. <laughs> <laughs> you like that one, huh? Yeah. I'm surprised. Just dumb enough. <laughs> Wait, what do you mean? Oh, I mean dumb in a good way. Okay. A dumb joke is what my one of my biggest compliments. You know, we have really been hit with the um, accusations of dad jokes a lot more frequently lately. Have you noticed? Well, more than we did 10 years ago. Yeah. You know, we're getting older, and that's when dad jokes start creeping in. So these people are right. They are correct. Man, never <laughs> would have thought I'd live to see the day, literally. That's right. We, we, we still stop before we hit puns. Yeah, we're no Strickland. Nope. That's ageless. That's just some sort of mental defect. <laughs> It has nothing to do with age. <laughs> yeah, not ageless is in timeless, and you could do that anytime, and it's great. <laughs> right. Yeah, the opposite of that. So, Chuck, speaking of um, opposites of that, let's talk about whether or not the Inca actually ever created a written language of any sort. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was cool, and I would love to do a longer-form show on the Inca period, uh, the Inca people, because... Man, when you when you start poking around a little bit mm-hmm. uh, at the things that they achieved and when it happened, mm-hmm. it's pretty striking. Well, you know, we did an episode called How Did 168 Conquistadors Bring Down the Inca Empire? Did we really? Mm-hmm. That was a good one, but <laughs> I, I'm sure there's still plenty more to talk about with them. We could do one just on the Inca, I'll bet. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, here's, here's an, a, a couple of things in the way of an overview. Uh, they had the largest pre-Columbian empire in the Americas. A lot of people during the Bronze Age. Mm-hmm. And you're not successful as a people that, that, that can grow and thrive like that unless you're doing some of these things like uh, building roads to the tune of 25,000 miles of highway. Right. That's amazing. Yeah, there was something like 12, I saw 10 to 12 million people in the Inca Empire who were walking along the 25,000 miles of of highway, which, by the way, cut through the Andes. It was largely in the the Andes, up in the Andes, Mm -hmm. which is not a hospitable place to form a civilization in the first place. No, man, but they did. They thrived uh, where it was uh, dry and harsh and steep. And they were able to uh, engineer, like, the kind of farmland at the altitudes, at these altitudes that you would never think would be possible. Right. Like millions of acres of really high-altitude terraced farms. Mm -hmm. And the way that I saw that the the whole thing worked was there were clans and villages and groups that all kind of, um, they did their own thing. And they paid tribute to the what you would call kind of the federal government, the Inca chiefs, the people um, who were who had the whole empire together. Mm-hmm. And then the Inca who were running the show would in turn provide these these people, like the farmers and the villages and the clans, with stuff they needed. It bore a striking resemblance to like Soviet communism. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and they kept it going for about 150 years. Again, until the Spans showed up, they were they were a very powerful empire. But the weird thing about the Inca is that they were able to do all this. That included math and abstract thought and um, major like socio political administration. Yeah, they appeared to have done it without any written language whatsoever. That's been basically the way that people have viewed the Inca for a very long time. Yeah, which is is remarkable because it's not like, oh, well, this was back during the Bronze Age. Like, the Maya had written languages. The Aztecs did. Mesopotamians did. Mm -hmm. Egyptians, of course, did. Chinese did. So a lot of people were writing things down, and uh, it it appeared, and we're still not super sure, but – or are we? Like, can we say definitively? Uh, we're almost, but no, okay. I don't think we can definitively <laughs> say it. It's sure starting to look that way. All right. So let, let's get to the the sort of the heart of the story then. Is is it, I believe it's pronounced Kipu. Uh, yeah. K-H-I-P-U. Or, or key, Q-U-I-P-U. Right. Which would also be pronounced Kipu. 
Right. Uh, but if you look this up on the internet, if you can pull your car over or whatever, don't do anything dangerous. <laughs> right. They are these uh, really kind of cool, it looks like macrame almost, these knotted, which I know you like. Oh, yes. Uh, these knotted links of cord uh, made from cotton sometimes. Sometimes it's uh, llama or alpaca wool. And you would see them hung up in rows uh, that looks like like from a curtain rod or something. Uh, from but it, that that curtain rod is really like a thicker central rope, and these things would just hang down. And for many many years, some of them were color coded, uh, but for many years, people thought that these were uh, just like art, right? Arts, crafts, that kind of thing, like something somebody crafts. would do when they were bored, you know. <laughs> and a lot of them were lost because the the Spanish, when they showed up, oh, they found man. them everywhere. Yeah, and they were like, "Well, I don't know what this is, so I'm just gonna burn them." Yeah, I'm going to kill everybody and burn everything. And so for a long time, people, yeah, they just had them in museums. They were they were Incan relics of a, an empire that had crumbled and gone away. So people were like, we got to preserve these. And they took them to museums. Um, but it wasn't until the 1920s that a guy named Leland Locke, who was studying them at the uh, Museum of Natural History in New York, who said, you know what? I think these actually are symbolic. I think they encode information. And I think that they probably are used to kind of tabulate things. And he he was right. Boy, that sounds like a good cliffhanger, my friend. Oh, okay. I should take out the he was right part then. <laughs> <laughs> but was he? We'll, Who knows? we'll find out right after this. He was. Okay, so he was right. Yeah, he was totally right. <laughs> uh, Leland Locke was correct, and what he found was that these uh, these kipu uh, knots were definitely used, and this is the part that we for sure know. Mm -hmm. um, it was sort of like a calculator or an abacus um, or a, a file that you would use to, to, like, instead of writing down numbers and putting it in a file cabinet, mm -hmm. you would knot this thing up to represent like a census or something like that, or yeah. maybe how much, uh, you know, uh, how many cow brains you had on hand in the back <laughs> or how many llamas you had. Cow brains? Sure. They probably okay. had cow brains, right? I don't think so. I think that's how rumors get started, Chuck. Oh, okay. Well, whatever. They're, whatever they want to keep track of. <laughs> uh, it served as, as, as an abacus, essentially. Yeah, it, it stored information. Uh, like they kept track of all that tribute that was coming in from the the 130 different clans under them. Like it was a it was it was a way to store information. But that is boring and pedestrian. And it, it still says that the Inca managed to keep track of all this and do all this stuff without a written language. Like that does not happen. Usually you have a written language and then math develops later. The Inca developed all this or it appeared that they did without a written language. But that's just what it seemed to be. Like, nobody could figure out or see any written language in this for a very long time. Well, and here's the thing, too, uh, that I didn't mention. It's not as simple as, I have 10 llamas, so I'm going to tie 10 knots on this string. Oh, yeah, good point. So it was like the height of the knot and where it was positioned on the cord. Uh, it all symbolized different things. The color symbolized something. Mm -hmm. They had, had multiples, like one thing, the way, you know, it could be done in such a way where it represented a hundred or a thousand. Uh, so it wasn't just like, you know, eight beads means eight cows. Right, yeah. So like um, if you have three knots, right, and the top one has like five loops and the middle one has five loops and the bottom one has two loops, what you're seeing is 552, so, like, the top one is Amazing. the hundreds column, the middle one's the tens, and the, the lower ones is the singles. Um, so, yeah, and so, so, like, there was, it wasn't just, like, one, yeah, counting off like that. It was much, much more sophisticated than that. And, uh, you know, the color that, that they used, the type of material that they used, the direction the knot was tied in, the number of loops it had. So cool. There were all sorts of things. So, when you, when you take that, you know, if you have three different dimensions or five or seven or ten different dimensions of something— um, those things start to interact, and now you have a lot of different symbols to choose from to encode information. But again, everyone just thought that it was just numbers that they were encoding. Until, the I think, the 1990s, when a Harvard anthropologist named Gary Erton 
um, who spent years working on on analyzing these, finally was like, no, there is there's words in here. There's names in here, and if there's names in here. Or sim- symbols of names, then that means that they're encoding more than just numbers. They're encoding abstract thoughts like a language does. Yeah, and, and Erton started to look into this because, like, despite all the great work Locke did to crack this code, by all accounts, he pretty much did, there were still a bunch of these uh, configurations that did not fit with the rest, and he always just sort of thought those were outliers and maybe those were arts and crafts or for ceremonies or something. But it was Erton who picked that back up and was like, I don't know, man, why would they go through all this trouble to design this intricate numerical recording system mm-hmm. and then just have the same exact thing just be crafty? He's like, there's something else going on here. Right, exactly. So um, he was, I guess, teaching a freshman economics student named Manny Madrano who managed to crack a little bit more of the code um, and and was the one who showed, I can't remember exactly what he showed, but he he took Erton's decades of work and in, in, in a spring break said, yep, here's some, here's some indications that the colors are actually <laughs> indicating like abstract <laughs> thoughts, like, like green um, might be like cattle, and that's a concrete thought, but but red equals war or something. So he he cracked the code a little further. Over spring break? Over spring break. <laughs> and he was like, and I figured it out and passed me the beer bong. Right, exactly. <laughs> Which we called, we didn't, we called him funnel. Yeah, beer Funneling. bong. I mean, I guess it, it makes sense because there's a. I'm sure it's a regional uh, phrase. I'll bet you're right too. We just called it funnel and beer. And by the way, you shouldn't do it, everyone. It's dangerous stuff. It is, and it's it's just dumb. I've never funneled a beer. <laughs> oh, I did it a few times. It's just stupid. Actually, let me tr- let me change that. I can't recall ever funneling a beer. <laughs> I never did any of that dumb stuff. Keg stands or funneling. Mm-hmm. Just stupid. It is a little stupid, but I mean, <laughs> yeah, it is stupid. I just sat there as a 19-year-old on my, my credit corduroy couch stirring my martini. <laughs> right. <laughs> just clucking your tongue at all of the Philistines. Yeah. Uh, All right, so he figures this out on spring break. It was a big, like, it was a big breakthrough that not only were these uh, used for numbers and record keeping, but like you said, like, potentially we do have an entire not language laid out in front of us, but most of this stuff is gone. Right. Like, that's the big tragedy. Yes. So, so this is the current thinking is that, yes, there are definitely abstract thoughts, possibly even phonetic sounds encoded in these along with numbers. Like yeah, Leland sure. Locke wasn't wrong. He didn't misinterpret it. But he found, he found um, that or the, over time they found that, no, there's abstract thoughts in here too. And there's a couple of pieces of evidence that really back this up. One, they found kipus in burials. Yeah. Right? Why would you be buried with a, 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 an abacus, a census document. Yeah. Nobody would, but you might be you might be buried with a something that's basically like a narrative of some battle that you showed your bravery in and that was like the greatest thing you ever did in your life. You might be buried with something like that. So that's one point. And then a, a researcher at St Andrews University in Scotland, Sabine Highland, um, did some analysis of two kipus that are Incan that were from the the Spanish colonial area or um, era that supposedly the people, the villagers who were preserving these things said, these are, these de- these tell of a great war. Yeah, that's and, that was key. For sure. So these things are supposed to have a narrative code within them, and she analyzed them and found like, yeah, there's something going on here. Yeah, I mean, she got back up because they said, yeah, the different materials mean something, mm-hmm. and you, you guys are, uh, you guys are figuring this out. She, she found that there are 95 different symbols encoded in these kipus, which is way more than you need for, um, like, a counting system, Yeah, but much more in line with something like a language. We still haven't cracked it yet, but it's starting to, to be clear that the Inca did develop a written language. We just can't understand it. Yeah, And the way that it was lost to history is the same as if um, all of the monks in England had been killed off in 1100 when they were the only ones who knew how to read and write. That the uh, like that stuff that they encoded in in English would have been lost to the the English people who survived 
and who are still around today, but have no, I couldn't tell you what this Bible says because it's in English and the monks didn't live long enough to pass along how to do this. I loved that last analogy. Thanks, man. That's fantastic. Chuck, I appreciate that, and I don't want to push my luck any further, so let's end this one. <laughs> Agreed. If you want to know more about the Incas or Kipu, there's a lot out there to learn. Just go check it out on the internet, and in the meantime, you can reach us via email at stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. <laughs>